Welcome to Startup Health Now, the weekly web show that celebrates the healthcare transformers and change makers reimagining health. My name is Unity Stokes, and today we are here at the Wearable Tech and Digital Health Conference in New York City. We've got a very special guest, Deborah Estrin, who is the director of the Small Data Lab at Cornell Tech, where she's also a professor. Stick around, it's a great show. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. Well, I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to those who take those who take it. So welcome to Startup Health Now, Deborah. Um, I thought we'd start out uh, just with a, a big question, which is everybody knows what big data is. What is small data? Absolutely. So big data is very important. It's getting a huge amount of hype across all sectors and it really deserves it, right? And by big data, it's across large numbers of consumers, patients, clients, big N. And there's and tons you, of money flowing in from and you VC. Look at, and, and you look at data across all of those and what can you learn right. that you never had the data across all of them before? What can you learn by looking across that data? And small data is just complementary to it and it says, as an individual, or for an individual, for N of one, for me, for you, right, for your aunt, uncle, if you look at all of their different data streams over time, how can you leverage that data over time to learn about their patterns and their responses? So it's really, in some sense, it's the same data. It's that person's row from all the different sources of big data, their column, whichever way you look at it. So are these um, just practical examples, uh, yeah. you know, steps people are taking? Um, what, what are some examples yes. of the types of small data just that exist in people's everyday lives? Absolutely. So it's w the steps you take can be measured by Fitbit, can be measured by your phone in the background because accelerometers are everywhere. But any one data stream doesn't tell that rich of a story, doesn't provide very rich of a feedback loop. It's really in combination. So when I begin to combine the steps I take with the words I use, with the busyness on my calendar, with my browsing history, with my Netflix binging, or having just moved, I was binging on uh, Street Easy, right? <laughs> so. It's those detailed patterns across our digital interactions, and now so many of our, our interactions, period, and our transactions are digitally mediated. And how, why is this important in the context of health and healthcare? Absolutely. What does this mean for everyday, either patients or just consumers? Right, so um, I like to think of it as helping to fill the gap between what we're born with and what we suffer from. Right? So yes, we're born with certain genetic makeup, and that does determine our tendencies, our proclivities, but a lot of, just listen to every talk, every paper about genomics, it all depends on exposure to X, Y, or Z, ex behavior X, Y, or Z. And so it's very important for health to capture that other half that's determining whether we actually develop type 2 diabetes, whether we move from pre-diabetic to diabetic, uh, understanding what your triggers are as a migraine sufferer, uh, understanding what your triggers are for flares as a multiple sclerosis sufferer. So, and even understanding what form of physical therapy works for you as somebody who's dealing with a herniated disc. So, from across our spectrum of chronic disease in particular, the 
role of our behavior and also just bringing good feedback to doctors requires measurements outside of a clinical setting. Mm. So you can't just measure things in the doctor's office at a time of a clinical visit, and doctors know that. They take patient histories all the time. This is measuring your life, things going this on in your This is measuring life. your life. At, and if you look at the um, Nature article that Sage Bio Networks published off of the first year of data off of the Empower study, which is their Parkinson study. They already show the level of variability in the symptoms you see. There's never been that kind of measure, even with in-person variability of the symptom. Hmm. So there's been lots of data at point of clinical visit. But how do the symptoms vary within a person? And it matters because if you're suffering from Parkinson's, you're always balancing how much of the medication you're taking how much you can take, when to optimize it for the functional part of your day, and you're balancing the effectivity of the, of the drug versus any side effects. Mm. And so it's all about this sort of personal optimization, and that kind of optimization can't happen without good feedback. And now these data streams give us an opportunity to really have that high resolution feedback from individuals. What are some of the big challenges in terms of um, really making sure consumers get access to the data or that, that this data actually becomes valuable or useful to everyday people? Okay, so a couple of things. First of all, to have it be useful at a, clinically, clinicians need to know how to interpret it. Mm. And we are just now on the cusp of people systematically gathering this kind of evidence so that we can figure out how to pull out of it what is really a digital biomarker or a behavioral biomarker, right? To have all this step data, to have all the step data and your Netflix data and your uh, language use data, it's way too much data in the raw. There's tons of noise, confounding factors. So the research community is now in the process of taking these data streams and figuring out how do you pull out what is actionable for the doctor and how do you then pull out what is actionable uh, for the patient. But it has to have a clinical basis and we have to be able to turn these data streams, which are so impressive, into something that is, ac that is actionable. And then from the perspective of the consumer, they need access to their digital traces, not because most people have time to be a quantified selfer, but because we will increasingly see apps and services that are personalized because they consume your personal data and then personalize feedback to you. And in order to do that, you have to be able to authorize, okay, just like when you download an app to your phone, you say, okay, I'll give it access to my location history and my contacts because I know it needs that to do its job. You will permission access to your health applications to have access to these different data streams, both from your phone and from Google and from Netflix in order to have that app be able to be really smart about you. Hmm. So I know you're, you're focusing on these issues every day at, at Cornell Tech. Yep. Um, maybe share with the audience what's going on at Cornell Tech and some of the exciting, just the mission overall and some of the exciting developments there. Sure, so if we look at genomics, it was really led by, as it needed to be, by biologists, by clinical researchers, and they've led and continue to lead very strongly there. <clears throat> on this side of the equation, where it's about understanding and interacting with people in their everyday lives, it's now an opportunity for the technologists and the designers, mm -hmm. the behavioral psychologists, to really come together and lead this side of that revolution in collaboration with clinicians and all of that. And that's really what Cornell Tech is about. It's about creating research hubs that bring together people around the digital disciplines training master's students, uh, supporting advanced PhD research, and moving it forward with a very engaged faculty. And you know, within that context, I think New York City itself is such an interesting ecosystem because of uh, the collaborative environment. There's so many different industries here, so many different yep. types of people. Um, maybe speak to that point. Why, why is New York, why New York? City uh, a, a great, why New York uh, for, for Cornell Tech? Right, so we've seen lots of advances, uh, advances in digital health, pretty much focused more on the clinician's problem and on the institution's problem. 
And the perspective on the patient's problem is very much like a perspective on a consumer's problem. And where else is the right place to seriously solve consumer-facing problems? Mm. And so here we have an increasing digital competency and excellence coming together with a long history of excellence in things that are consumer and media and communications focused. So it's really just an incredible time and all underlaid by the fact that consumers have adopted mobile technology at a rate and a prevalence that nobody ever expected. Hmm. So since you're seeing so many exciting things and you're around so many uh, both students but also engineers, entrepreneurs, scientists, people focusing on, on this innovation, what are you most excited about today? To me it's that coming together of deep understanding of how to put the technology to work, the algorithms, approaches to machine learning, understanding of computer vision, natural language processing, in the presence of patient-facing and consumer-facing problems, and this uh, appetite for doing rapid uh, iteration on problems. So 20 years out, we all agree sort of where things will be. It's not so clear how we're going to get there. What I'm excited about it being in New York City, it being at Cornell Tech, is the appetite to engage in rapid iterations on things we can do, not just in 20 years, but in 20 weeks, in 20 months, not only 20 minutes, not only 20 years, but that really valuable space in between where you have time to build, experiment, get out in front of people, learn from what they do, and keep going. You know, I think one of the criticisms is often at these early stages, especially, you know, the question of how will this impact everybody? Mm -hmm. um, do you think, um, it's a broad question of what this is, but yep. do you think uh, these digital health innovations, let's say, um, will end up impacting whole populations, uh, underserved communities, people that um, may not necessarily be able to afford the most expensive tools or technologies yep. at the at the beginning. Um, what's your view on that and where things are going and how this will, innovation in general in digital health will impact people? Right, so if you look at mobile penetration and smartphone penetration, uh, people who cannot afford high speed uh, cable at home, that smartphone is their point of connection to the internet. Mm. And they use it for their, uh, for their commerce. Now, if you go down to a point where you're talking about people who um, aren't eligible for credit cards, uh, there you begin to have some digital divide, which we need to pay attention to. But I'd say the greater digital divide is probably uh, based on age. Mm. And across socioeconomics, the generation that did not grow up with digital are those who are less comfortable with it. And if you go to today's elderly, today's 70, 80, 9 year olds, the match of mobile is not so great. But for those of us who in another 15 years will be 70, we have come through this digital basis to the way we run our lives. And it's pretty broad across socioeconomics. And in some ways, if you're at the very top 1%, you can afford a lot of personal assistance in the form of people mm. and assistance in your life. And the scalability and opportunity of personalization through mobile and through small data and through automation makes some of that personalization affordable for the first time. Mm. Is this also a design challenge? It seems like, um, you know, so many, uh, if, if there's a, an age divide, let's yep. say, um, maybe enough folks aren't thinking or designing within the context of who their audience really is. It's a very important question, also from the perspective of when you design only for that endpoint end consumer, you sometimes miss the fact that important things happen for people in some social context. Mm. So it might be the adult child caregiver that you really should be designing for of the elder patient, as opposed to only thinking about that elder patient. Hmm. Uh, it might be somebody who's uh, an Alcoholics Anonymous sponsor, rather than uh, the sponsoree. It might be somebody who's getting uh, tutoring 
first generation college student, emerging young adult, and is getting some kind of tutoring or coaching from a senior or another. So we, we sometimes overly design for an individual, assuming they're on their own and data and apps are just to serve them. Whereas if we uh, begin to design for small groups, we also avoid that problem of missing a generation or missing people who are vulnerable in a way that might make the technology less accessible to them directly. Great, so uh, what would your advice be to entrepreneurs building today, people building today, innovating today, maybe lessons learned or things that, that they should be focusing on? Um, so a lot of people start out and are very concerned with scaling up. And I think in this space of human facing technology, it's really important to develop design and focus on something that scales down. If it doesn't scale down, you can't get out there quickly and get feedback on your idea from real people. Because you never launch at scale. How are you gonna get to scale with the right product and service that is actually useful to people if it doesn't scale down, if it doesn't provide utility at small numbers and at small penetration, it'll be much harder to get to a successful product at scale that's actually useful. Right, Facebook didn't even launch it at scale, right? Started, started small. Um, that's very interesting. So a couple of fun questions. Um, do you have a favorite book that you would recommend to innovators, students, entrepreneurs today that, uh, that would help them? So Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman. Yes, written by a Nobel Prize winner, but it's, it's the sort of Bible of behavioral economics mm. and behavioral science. And it's hard to think about any application in the context of health where you don't need to understand what's going on in people's brains and psyches. Okay, how about a favorite technology or tool or app that, that you love to use? So pretty low tech, uh, but okay. again, with, with, with health in mind, I would say it's podcasts while running, right? Oh, I like that. So you bundle these things, and I get to listen to that next uh, episode of a podcast while I'm running around Central Park. So you, you beat me to my last question, which yes. is what do you do to, to stay healthy? So it sounds like you run. I do run. And in general, I try to uh, plan my life so that it has these times to run planned in, as important as a meeting with my students or my dean, is getting there in there on my calendar, my runs. I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's thank been you. a wonderful conversation. Thank you.